Thank you for joining us uh, this morning for our WP Carey speaker. The WP Carey speaker is an annual lecture series that brings students yesterday and parents today face to face with prominent college admission officers from around the country. I'm just. Sorry, <laughs> background noise. The W.P. Carey speaker is brought to us and funded through the W.P. Carey Fund for Excellence in College Counseling, established at Pomfret in 2014 by the late Bill Carey, Pomfret class of 1948. Bill served as president of the Pomfret Alumni Association, member of the Board of Trustees, and finally as honorary life trustee. In addition to his service, Bill created several endowed funds at the school including the William Polk Carey Scholarship Fund, the William Polk Carey Chair in Mathematics, the W.P. Carey Fund for Excellence in College Admissions, and the W.P. Carey Fund for Excellence in College Counseling. It's my pleasure at this time to introduce Sam Prouty, who is our 2022 W.P. Carey Speaker. Sam is Director of Admissions at Middlebury College, a place near and dear to my heart. I'm a proud graduate of Middlebury's master's program. Uh, Sam joined Middlebury's admission, staff, uh, Middlebury's admission staff in 2014 and was appointed Director of Admissions in 2019. He began his career in college admissions at Swarthmore College, which is his alma mater, where he, he earned a BA in English and Economics. He then spent 11, a total of 11 years uh, on the high school side of the desk as a college counselor and award-winning teacher at the Hutchins School in Lakeville, Connecticut, and at Buckingham, Brown, and Nichols School in Cambridge, Mass., He's a frequent guest speaker on all matters pertaining to college admissions, and he enjoys dispensing free admission guidance. So please don't hesitate. Please don't hesitate to ask him your questions. It's my pleasure to welcome, and please join me in welcoming Sam Prouty. Thanks so much for doing I'm going to open with a quick story. So I'm the only child of parents who didn't go to college. And so you can imagine the, um, you can imagine what that process was like, because they had only me to get it right. And uh, the very first college tour we ever went on, um, I'm not going to tell you the college I was going to, but I'm not going to. We went on a lovely college tour. I was looking at all sort of small liberal arts colleges. And uh, the young man giving the tour showed us a dorm, and then he ultimately showed us his dorm room. And we walked into this dorm room. And my mother immediately began to cry. <laughs> and this very nice young man went up to my mother, and he kind of <clears throat> put his hand on her shoulder and said, ma'am, ma is everything all right? And she wheeled around on this kid, and she stuck her finger in his face, and she said, I want your mother's phone number, because she should know that her son lives in this kind of filth. We finished that tour. We can continue to go on that tour. And this is, this is 27 years ago. Um, and so this is back when you could smoke in public. And my father used to always be 10 feet at the back of the tour smoking his cigarettes, which he did constantly. It's also why he's not here anymore, so don't smoke. Um, and so we, at this, on the same college, we were taken to a beautiful outdoor amphitheater. And the tour guide was, you know, this is where we have convocation. This is where we graduate. Sometimes our alums get married here in this amphitheater. It was just in, an incredibly beautiful, borderline spiritual space. And from the back of the tour of 25 people smoking a cigarette, my father said, looks like a lot of people probably lost their virginity right here. <laughs> so, so I've been doing this work for a long time. I, I think because I would like to get it right. Finally, I would like to help you all get it right, if I can, having been somebody who didn't always get the college process right uh, myself. Um, so I'm going to just start with this idea, the potentially radical idea, that the college admissions process is not about the college. If you start with the college and go backwards, you're doing it wrong, OK? And let's just, I'm a pretty blunt guy, so let's just have a blunt conversation. If there is a particular school, if there's a name that you need to have as a sticker on the rear window of the family SUV, then you know what? Go online, because any school store for three bucks will sell you that sticker. And put the sticker on the back of the car, 
and then tell your kids they can go wherever they want to go. So if you're starting with the school, how do I make that school want me? Then with all due respect, we're starting it wrong. So I think we should flip this whole thing around. The college process is not really the college process. It's the student process. And so the best things that we can do is really think about how this is a process who, uh, but whereby we ask students a couple of key questions. And when I talked to your children yesterday, I'm sure they've all completely forgotten by now. But if any of them happen to remember what I talked about yesterday, I said that college admissions people are essentially asking three questions. Who are you right now? Who are you in the process of becoming? And how is it that we're going to help you get there? And so as parents and college counselors and faculty members and all of the other wonderful people here are helping with kids, these are the questions that I would suggest we ask our kids. Um, other versions of that question that we're asking on, on my side of the desk, you know, what are the resources that have been available to you and how have you taken the most advantage possible of those resources, right? Um, you have all made the choice and sacrifice to send your kids to this wonderful school. So you have already enhanced the number of resources available to them. And so really the question for college people becomes, that's great. What, now what have you done with that? And actually, and we can talk about mastery transcripts if you want to, but that's, that's sort of what that's getting at, right? Is answering that question. Who were you when you showed up? Who are you now that you're in the process of leaving? And how have you taken advantage of the various resources that have been put uh, in front of you. So a little bit of history. Um, when I started at Middlebury College nine years ago, Middlebury College had 8,000 applications. Last year, we had 13,500. When I started in this business 23 years ago, the acceptance rate at the most selective colleges in the country, not necessarily the Ivies, because they're always more selective. But I went to Swarthmore, so, you know, the Swarthmore Amherst, Williams, Bowdoin, Bates, that sort of set, that's what I'm most familiar with. The acceptance rates at those colleges tended to be around a third. Now it's 14%, 12, 9, 8. There are just more kids applying to colleges, and those more kids applying to colleges are applying to more colleges than they used to. So just a little bit of sort of setting the stage here. Um, over time, I have seen an increase in specialization. Some of you with high-level athletes, I'm sure, see this. When I was a high school student, you could be a bang-up tennis player, and then in another season, be a hockey player, and then in another season, be in the orchestra. And nowadays, we have, we have seen an increase in specialization among young people, so that if you're the bang-up tennis player, you're playing tennis year-round. Um, there's certainly been an increase in diversity, equity, and inclusion work for colleges. In the, in the nine years I've been at Middlebury, the number of our American students of color have gone from about 25% to 38%, the number of students who are the first in their family to go to college has gone from about 15% to 25. The number on financial aid has gone up, and the amount of that financial aid per student has gone up. Um, so there's a real focus on that. At the same time, thanks to COVID, there's one good thing that came out of COVID, and that is the testing juggernaut uh, has really been dealt a, I don't know if it's a death blow, but it's been dealt a blow, right? I, when I taught at Hotchkiss, I, I had some of you might be doing this, so no judgment. But I remember I had students whose parents were, I mean, I'm a car guy. I, I see everything through the lens of, could, you know, can I add another car to my collection? Um, and there were people who were spending car money, and I mean nice car money, just getting their kids prepped to take the SAT, right? Nowadays, hundreds and hundreds of colleges are test optional that used to require test, testing. Um, we have seen, over time, a sort of a decrease in access to raw data. 25 years ago, lots of, lots of colleges ranked their students. That is quickly going away. Lots of colleges calculated a GPA or they weighted that GPA. That has ceased over the years. Um, so we have this sort of interesting, you know, this is where the world is, right? There's higher selectivity, there's higher um, specialization at the same moment in time when we, college people, are getting sort of less or, or fewer data points of just raw numerical data. I actually think that's a good thing, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and then all of that's happening while lots of other things are changing. The demographics are changing. The population of young people in New England is going down, but it's going up in Florida. It's going up in Texas. Um, all the warm places. <laughs> it must be easier to breed there. I don't know. But um, 
but uh, that was a terrible joke. I'm sorry. Um, don't don't go off script, Sam. But no, the number. So the number the numbers of young people graduating from high school uh, are going down in some of the places that, frankly, colleges like Middlebury have traditionally considered main markets. Right. We do not struggle to get students from New England interested in Middlebury. We have struggled to get kids in Florida interested in Middlebury or Texas. Because if you live in Vermont and you say to a 17-year-old, let me tell you about a very tiny, very cold place that is nowhere near a city or public transportation. You know, it's a hard sales pitch, right? Um, and so colleges are aware of those demographic shifts. I, we're spending more of our staff time and money going to Texas and Southern California and Florida than we did 10 years ago. Because 10 years ago, we could easily fill the class with kids from Connecticut. We probably still could, but that's also uh, not necessarily the, the institution's goal. Um, a lot of people think that college admissions is basically about serving uh, two key constituents, the applicants themselves and the people who run colleges. And in my world, I, there's, a lot, there's a lot of people who are mad at me at any given moment in time, right? Um, and sometimes those people have themselves differing and conflicting um, goals, right? And so we are absolutely in the business of serving applicants themselves. We're all teachers. I think we all identify as people who are fundamentally teachers at our core. But we're not going to ignore the parents. We're not going to ignore our current students who have their own desires and goals and dreams for their college. You know, current Middlebury students who want Middlebury to move in a certain direction, who want their a cappella groups to continue to be great, and they need trumpet players in the jazz band, right? Um, obviously, college administrators and trustees have a role. Faculty members have a role in the admissions process, sometimes overtly. Sometimes colleges actually have teaching faculty on their admission teams. We don't. But um, you know, if you're, if you're the head of the, a particular department, you're the head of the classics department, well, you want to make sure that your admissions people are admitting Latin scholars and Greek scholars, right? Um, obviously, we're in close contact with, with high school counselors. And then, of course, uh, there's al always alums who have strong opinions about their school. Right? So the admissions process, in theory, has to um, fulfill the needs of all of those different individuals and constituencies. Because I tend to be a straight talker, let's just put it out there. So there was a time, maybe there is still a time, when the myth out there was, I'll send my kid to an expensive private school, and that expensive private school will be the ticket to the name on the back of the Land Rover. And here's the thing. There are lots of excellent schools in the United States and all over the world. This is one of them. But so are fill-in-the-blank other, other boarding schools. So are fill-in-the-blank number of private day schools. You know what? So is Wellesley Public High School outside of Boston and Concord Carlisle and Dover Sherburne and uh, Winchester, and let's go to New York, and go to Mamaroneck, and you know, I, on and on I could go, right? Suburban Chicago. And so, uh, frankly, if you all are tuition-paying parents at Pomfret because you think that the Pomfret name is going to make your kid get into college more easily than some other name, with all due respect, the best thing you should do is move to the most under-resourced school you can find in North Dakota. Right? And have your kid excel in that environment um, because it's not necessarily you know, the name. I used to work at Hotchkiss um, as a college counselor. And I had lots of families say to me, but the colleges know, right? The colleges know that my B minus student at Hotchkiss would absolutely have been an A plus student someplace else. The data does not show that that is true. And so no, so no colleges don't know that because as it turns out, that's not accurate. Now, having said that, you're definitely getting your money's worth out of Pomfret, I promise, because Pomfret is challenging your students. It's putting your students in small classes where their teachers not only know them very well, they also know them as dorm parents and coaches and faculty advisors, and on and on we go. So when we read those recommendations, when we read the profile of a student from here, we're reading the profile of a student who is deeply known and therefore represented holistically and thoroughly in the process. The education your kids are getting definitely worth that investment. Um, but I think that sort of myth of the old days, right, where the, the director of college counseling at Exeter had a couple of scotches with the dean of admissions at Harvard, and then by the end of their drinks, you know, everything was decided. That is not how it works. I wish it were. 
Um, at, I'd love to have a couple of scotches and then just be done, be done my process. Um, so I, I have two children myself. Um, my seventh grade daughter named Meredith, I should have brought, frankly, I should have brought her here uh, because I'm, we're starting to introduce her to the idea of, uh, of what her school options are. So I, I identify with this cartoon in very deep and profound ways. <laughs> um, because I absolutely am that dad who, you know, was trying to push my kids out of the door when it was time to go to school and time to embrace new opportunities. And I'm already that dad who, if I have to talk about the idea that my kid might go away in a couple of years, you know, I'll probably become a mess, right? So as parents, we have, we're, we're inherently conflicted animals, right? We want the best for our kids. We want them to be independent. We want them to thrive. We want them to be their best selves. And we just desperately want them to stay home and want to hug us all day and leave it at that. Um, but I do think that uh, the, allowing your children to be here and then ultimately, obviously, sending them out to college um, is really one of the best gifts that you can give them. Right? You are giving them independence and autonomy and the ability to determine some of their own academic and personal outcomes. And we in the college process, when we read students, that, you know, again, who are you now? Who are you in the process of becoming? If students have answers to those questions, they are already at an advantage when it comes time to apply to school. Right? When I read that essay or those recommendations, I'm looking for the student who has some sense of who they are and what makes them tick and what is it about the world that fires them up or gets them out of bed in the morning or makes them angry. What are the problems that they want to solve? And the more that they are capable of answering those questions out of high school, the more desirable they are uh, as candidates to college. Um, there are 4,000 colleges and universities in this country. There are probably only 40 or 50 of them that are famous. And uh, I'll tell you, as somebody who does this for a living, and I, and I work, in theory, I work at one of those famous colleges, um, I know that there are schools out there that you have never heard of. And I can't wait to introduce them to my own children because they're great and you haven't heard of them, which means it's easier to get into those schools. Right? And so there are lots of excellent, excellent schools with remarkable programs that might be a great fit for your kids and mine. Um, let's not make the mistake that a highly selective college inherently equates to a better lived experience as a young person. Right? I'm a car guy. Is a BMW more fun to drive than a Volkswagen? Yeah, a little, but not, not as reflected in their prices. Right. The BMW is not twice as wonderful as the Volkswagen. And a school with a 40% admit rate is not half as good as a school with a 20% admit rate. Um, as you work with your children to sort of think about college, ask them a lot of questions. My, and I know there's a session after this about sort of the parent role, so I won't get too much into that. I would suggest that our job as parents is to ask questions and not give answers. Right. My beloved parents, you know, were, were, they were distinctive <laughs> in this process, for sure. Um, when we did our tour, we got in the family car and we, uh, we visited 14 schools in nine days, starting in central Massachusetts, where I'm from, uh, as far north as Maine, as far south as North Carolina, and then home. And at, ev at the end of every single tour, we got in the car and my parents lit up a cigarette <laughs> and told me all of the things that they thought none of which were helpful. <laughs> um, and that ranged from, you know, my father, well, you know, Sammy, 30 years ago, my buddy Spocky went here. And uh, I mean, Spocky's an idiot. You don't want to go to this school. Um, you know, and so you want to <laughs> ask your children questions about them and about who they are and about what they need. Ask them some of the basics. You've gone to school in this beautiful, kind of rural, very small place. Did beautiful and small and rural work for you? And if the answer is yes, then bring them to Middlebury. And if the answer is no, then honor that. All right, so we're looking at bigger schools. We're looking at schools in the city. Talk about the culture of a school, right? There are schools in this country that have 30,000 students. And on football day, you know, the boys take off their clothes and they paint their bodies and they, you know, that's, that's one version of school culture. But I mean, for me, as a dorky little theater guy who liked reading books, I could not go to a school like that. right? So I had to find schools where you could be a dorky little theater boy who liked books. Um, and that's OK, because there are schools that will 
fulfill all of those kind of cultural needs. And so, you know, really a ask lots of questions and be prepared to get to know your children in a way that you don't yet know them. Some of those answers might really surprise you, right? Who's the best teacher that you had at Pomfret and what made that person the best teacher? And how do we then look for educational experiences that will mirror that in the college process? Um, you know, what do you, like to do with your, what do you like to do with your friends? What do you want to be able to do, right? The young man whose name I'm forgetting, the theater guy, Kaya, right? So Kaya's college process could have, in, could have involved straight up theater schools, right? Emerson or Tisch at NYU. It could also involve small liberal arts colleges that have great theater. Because maybe Kaya's answer to his parents and his college counselors was, yeah, I love theater, but I also really love French. And I want to be able to go to a school with a bang up French program and a theater program that will put me in a position to move to Hollywood and actually try to do this, right? Yep. And that's, that's, that's what we all want to hear, absolutely. Um, so what are we looking for? This is, this is what everybody likes to know. So at, at Middlebury College, and I can't speak for every school, obviously, um, but I, I think what I'm about to say is generally true, certainly of the smaller liberal arts kind of colleges that I, that I know. Um, we are looking to assess academics. One, one could argue that it's not the most important, but it's, it's probably tied, right? Um, how do we define academics? This came up in your talk, right? Academics is not just the grades that you get. Sam, I have straight A's, so I'm gonna get into Middlebury, right? What do you think my next question is? What did you take, right? Because you had straight A's, but you took three classes last year, and one of them was called The Alphabet Revisited. <laughs> and so your A's may or may not be impressive. And, and there are a lot of A's out there, which is why rigor is even more important, because the A in The Alphabet Revisited and Walking for Fitness is just not as impressive as the A in do-it-yourself neurosurgery in the 10th grade, <laughs> right? And when we get to that essay, I perform neurosurgery on my younger brother, and he's still alive, <laughs> right? So, you know, we look, grades never exist in a, in, a, in a vacuum. They exist in a context. That context is the school, what's offered, what is the rigor. If there is a GPA and rank given, we like to use it. If there isn't, don't worry. I'll read the 105 pages if I have to. Uh, scores are now optional widely. My very blunt advice on scores is, um, you know, don't submit them. There's a conspiracy theory out there that, like, we on my side will assume that you are a terrible tester if you don't submit your testing. We don't assume that. But if your children rock out the test and have a number that is at or well above the school sort of published mid-50% range, then sure, submit it. It can still help. Personally, I... Quote me if you want to. I think within five or 10 years, we're gonna actually be in a place where many schools are even test blind. So test optional is submit it if you want to, and we'll use it if you want us to. I think the next step is we, we're not even gonna look. And I, and I think it's gonna take a while, but I, I, think that we're, I think that we're headed there. The personal stuff is by far the most interesting. I talked to your children yesterday about sort of how much I love reading the essay. I gave them a couple of examples um, uh, of essays that I remember that sort of have stuck with me. Right? Who are you right now? Who are you in the process of becoming? How do you fill your time? You know, do you do one thing and just do it all the time? Swimmers. Every time I read a high-level swimmer, man, those poor kids, they never get out of the pool. Right? They swim in the morning. They go to class, they're still wet. They swim as soon as classes are over. They go to dinner, dripping wet. They get back in the pool after dinner. Right? So if you're a very, very high-level swimmer and you're sort of chart of activities on the common application has one entry that's not necessarily a worse resume than the kid who's in a whole bunch of clubs for 25 minutes a month, right? Because there, there can be some fluffing of the list out there. So don't worry about, you know, my kid is well-rounded or the opposite of that, I guess, would be pointy. That's what we talk about, right? Kid's pretty pointy, you know? Um, and that's okay. It's okay to be pointy if that's your sort of passion and that's where your talents live. But our number one question is always, what are the advantages that have been placed in front of you? What are the opportunities that have been placed in front of you? And how have you taken advantage um, of those opportunities? 
There are lots of other factors. Some schools use what they call demonstrated interest. At Middlebury, we don't care very much about this. But there are schools which will track how many times your children have been on the website, how many times have they emailed the college. When they receive emails, do they open the emails? How many seconds do they spend on the website? You have no idea how much information we have about, <laughs> about you. Um, uh, we, at Middlebury, again, we don't, we don't really play that game. There are schools that for whom yield, and yield is the term we use for how many of our admitted students are going to say yes to us, yield is a major concern, right? Imagine being that school who is sick and tired of losing their admits, well, to Middlebury <laughs> or some other school, right? And so those are schools where that demonstrated interest uh, piece is going to matter, uh, taking the tour, doing the interview, doing the online sessions, and so forth. Uh, early decision, we can talk about real quick. Early decision, as you probably know, is binding. Um, early action is non-binding, and then there's regular decision. Many of the smaller schools offer the binding early decision. Bigger schools tend to offer early action. It's all, it's all different, but that's a, a quick overview. Early decision in a binding way is the engagement ring of the college admissions process. It is your child's way of saying to the school, I've seen them all, and you are the one that I love. <laughs> and so let's have a future together, right? And so use early decision intelligently, because you can only do it once by definition. It's binding. You're promising, I will enroll at that school if you let me in. And so the college counseling office here has all kinds of tools uh, and their expertise to assess whether you're spending that chit intelligently, right? Um, if you want to go, if, if your number one school in the world is fill in the blank, incredibly, I'll pick on Williams. Williams is a great school, right? I like Williams. Um, and you have a B average at the Pomfret School. Statistically speaking, your child is not likely to get into Williams. And, and that's okay. Let's just own that and know that. And then if your child also loves St. Olaf in Minnesota, which is a college I talk about all the time because none of you have heard of it. And it's, and it's awesome. It's awesome. Go home and look up St. Olaf. And if your kid loves Williams and they also love St. Olaf, and we can know by looking at data, we, can't, we can never know for sure, but we can know pretty darn close to sure that Williams is a, a wicked stretch, but St. Olaf looks pretty likely, and we love St. Olaf, then I would, I would venture to say applying early to Williams might be a missed opportunity. Um, so you, and you'll think it would talk through all this with the college counselors and so forth. Legacy a Amherst College. Oh. Can you talk a little bit about the financial aid and the financial yes. aid there? Thank you for asking that. Thank you for asking that. Early decision is scary if you are not a full pay family because you have to wonder, am I now committing? Have I put the engagement ring on the finger of the school that I can't afford? And so as a general rule of thumb, if you apply early decision to a school, and if you are not given the financial aid that you need, that school will, of course, release you from the binding early decision. Nobody's going to force you to do something that you can't afford. Um, Middlebury meets full demonstrated financial need for all enrolling students. So in our case, in my nine years at the college, we've seen a very tiny handful of families pull out of early decision because they can't afford it, because the whole point is we're going to make we're going to make it so that you can afford it. Um, but if, you, if you're applying to a school and the number comes back and it's just way off from what you need, you can, you can withdraw from that. What is the timeline of the enrollment of the school So great question. How, do we get the financial aid in time? And so typically, uh, if you filled out all your financial aid paperwork on time, you'll get the financial aid award the same, in the same moment that you get the admission. I will also say the opposite, just because I, 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 I'm a straight shooter. If you are a full need family, a full, I'm sorry, a full pay family, if you are in that position, well, lucky you. Um, and, and you could use that to your advantage as well. Lots of colleges in this country are what they call need blind. I'm need blind. I, you, whether or not you're flush or broke or wherever you land in the middle does not matter to us when we read your application. And we'll admit you if we want to admit you regardless of your ability to pay. And we will give you the financial aid that you need. There are colleges that are need aware. And your ability to write that check in full will impact that college's decision regarding your child. And so that's another piece of the strategy. If your kid falls in love with two schools that are both very selective, one of them is need blind and one of them is need aware, 
your ability to write that big check now now does become part of that strategy. And just I'm just being straightforward about that. Frankly, I love to work at a school where that doesn't matter to us. But the truth is there aren't that many colleges in this country that can afford to be need blind for all students. Yep, they no, they're they'll tell you about that. So questions to ask as you visit. Are you need blind? Are you need aware? How do you meet financial need? Do you do it with merit scholarships? Do you do it with athletic scholarships? Do you do it based only on need? Do you meet the full need? Or are you not in a position to meet, you know, some schools gap students, which means I know you need 50 grand in help. I can only give you 30, and you're on your own to find the other 20. Um, personally, you know, I, I'm not a fan of those schools. And, and if you're in a position, if your kid is admitted to a school with a big gap, well, that's what, you know, if you live in a place like Vermont, as I do, that's where you're looking at, you know, Vermont schools, right? I would, if I can saddle my, my daughter with $100,000 in debt or have her go to UVM, she's going to go to UVM, which is a great school, by the way. Um, if your children have a talent, that talent is important to us. Maybe that talent is in theater or music or some other art form. They can submit a supplement in that art form. Um, at Middlebury, the supplement is guaranteed not to hurt you. So even if you're a math major, but you're a high-level dancer, and you want to submit that dance portfolio, go ahead. The dance department will review it, and they'll get back to us with some feedback. If that feedback is, this is amazing. This kid would be such a value added for our dance program. Obviously, that helps you. If the feedback is, uh, we think this child has some kind of inner ear damage. <laughs> um, she kept just falling down. Uh, it did not appear to be part of the dance. Um, then that does not actively hurt you. Some of your students will be ath athletes at a very high level, and, and I know you have a whole other session on, on recruitment, so I won't get into that, but athletic recruitment can change the whole picture. It also changes the timeline and moves up the timeline pretty significantly, and I'll, I'll leave the rest of that comment to, to the session after this about athletic recruiting, but that's certainly a, a major, major game changer. I thought I saw a hand go up. Yeah. So, yep, so Middlebury, I, I will. Okay, I will repeat the question. Thank you for that. I was asked a question about Middlebury and language programs, and I'm happy to answer. I'm going to be real quick because I don't think I was really here just to give the pitch for Middlebury, but I'm happy to give that maybe later. Uh, but Middlebury does have very strong language programs. We have a very strong environmental studies program, um, lots of others. If your kid is applying to a school that has a specialized program and your kid is interested in that specialized something, obviously that can be to their advantage. I'm a graduate of and a former employee of Swarthmore. Swarthmore is one of the very few small liberal arts colleges with an excellent program in engineering. So if your kid happens to be the small liberal arts college kid who loves engineering, then Swarthmore is going to want to know that. And Swarthmore is going to want to know that more than I'm going to want to know that at Middlebury. right? Uh, how are applications read? I'll just walk you through this. Um, if any of you are considering a career change, I just want to tell you, being a college admissions person is a lot of fun. It's very meaningful. We get to meet impressive young people. They pay me to meet impressive young people for a living and then to also build a class for, the, for my school that is the most interesting and diverse and well-rounded and fascinating class I can build. It's, it's a wicked cool way to make a living. And I just have to finish my pitch. You do get to be in a sort of lower tax bracket. So, <laughs> every file at Middlebury College is read by a minimum of two people. The, at least one of those readers is what we call the regional manager. I happen to be that for Connecticut. So I'm sort of the, sh the I'm the one who shepherds Connecticut applications through the process. But I will I'll have a partner assigned to me at random, and so two different eyes are on that file. That's important, right? Because my personal opinion should not be the only, excuse me, <coughs> should not be the only determining factor for your kid's future. And so a minimum of four eyeballs on every application. Those people bring different experiences and um, levels of experience and voices to that process. In our process, roughly half of those files then move on to what we call a full committee, and roughly half of those files are at that point set aside as, as likely denies. The half that move on to committee are read again by a room that has four or five people in it. It's very thorough. 
very technological. We've got screens everywhere. We're looking at all kinds of stuff in the applications themselves, data about the school. Um, we're talking to each other as we go. You know, there's conversation, right? We're talking about Bruce. Bruce had a C in chemistry. I, you know, I think we should have a deny here. And then my colleague says, no, no, did you read that essay about that time that uh, he captured a horse in the wild? <laughs> um, and that was, a re that was a really cool essay. Like, you got to read it. I don't know. I mean, that C in chemistry. Did you read teacher recommendation number two? Go read it. It'll make you cry. And teacher recommendation number two says, I've taught at Pomfret for 56 years. I wanted to retire four years ago, but that's when I met Bruce as a freshman. <laughs> and he's the reason. He's the reason that I stayed. Right? So there's a lot of voices in that committee. Um, what stands out? What's going to make us be captivated by your children? I don't necessarily know because I need to wait until I read about your children to know the answer to that, right? But I will say, and I'm a car guy, so please do forgive me. Um, <laughs> I, I think of the world, <laughs> I'm going to oversimplify you. Welcome to my mind. The world is either a world in which you're a Toyota Camry or you're a Saab 900, if we were going to oversimplify things. The Toyota Camrys, as you can probably sense where I'm going, are numerically perfect. A Toyota Camry is what we all should want. It's efficient, it's affordable, it's drop dead reliable, it will work until the day we die. But nobody in the history of Earth has ever inherited a million dollars and said, I'm gonna go get me a Camry, <laughs> right? I actually, until I started paying for private school for my kid, um, I had a small collection of Saab 900s. Saab 900, the Saab 900 is the most interesting car ever made. It's great fun when it works. <laughs> but when it doesn't work, it's a huge pain in the neck and it costs you most of your life savings to keep it on the road, right? And so as I'm building a class, I want Toyota Camrys, undoubtedly. I want the kids who are just, boom, reliable every day, they hit every mark, no misstep ever. But I also need some Saab 900s, because that's the flavor, right? Um, and it's an it's a incredibly gross oversimplification, right? Some students are a little bit of both, right? Maybe some students have a Toyota Camry transcript and a Saab 900 personality, and that's everybody's dream, right? But as, as we sort of look at these students, you know, we are balancing numerical achievement, as we've already discussed somewhat, and all those little esoteric things that make you who you are. The essay, the activities in which you participate, the person that you are in your greater community. And the truth is, because there is a lot of great inflation in the world, you know, and there's a lot of, and in my case, a lot of selectivity, there, I could throw a dart and hit a Toyota Camry. I could throw a dart and hit somebody who is numerically perfect. And that does not necessarily make them the most interesting applicant that we're going to read, right? And so, I really hope you hear me when I say the person that your kid is, who they are in this community, in your home community, in your family, the quirks and traits that they bring to the world. These things really do matter to us. That's why we do have counselor recommendations and teacher recommendations. Otherwise, we could just have a spreadsheet do all this work for us, right? So um, I want you to really hear me say that all that stuff matters a, a great deal. Okay, let's keep moving. Um, your kids will complete the application. This is getting into the weeds. They have a list of activities. They have essays. I like essays that surprise me. Your kid is the number one cross-country runner at Pomfret, all New England cross-country. Guess what? I'm going to know that. So there is no reason for your kid to write an essay that starts with, I love running. <laughs> right? But if that kid, who's the number one cross-country runner at this school, also happens to breed albino ferrets in his dorm room. And he's like the ferret kid around here, right? He shows up at the dining hall and they're, oh, there's, there's ferret kid, right? I mean, actually, I don't write your essay about that um, <laughs> now that I say that out loud. But whatever your thing is that makes you you, that makes you not 13,000 other people, that's the stuff we want to know. Who are you? How do you go through the world? What gets you fired up? What are you afraid of? What are you passionate about? It can be big, it can be very small. Kids write about shoelaces. They write about their favorite flavor of ice cream. Doesn't matter. Are we learning something about you and how you tick? 
how you move through the world. Those are the great essays. Recommendations are very uh, important for reasons I've already kind of touched on. The college counselors also fill out a, a great and, and thorough report and write, and write a recommendation that sort of captures who your kid is here at the school holistically, not just in one class. Sometimes there are supplements. Why have you applied to our school? Right? It's a, sort of a yield test. Uh, Middlebury does not have one of these. If your student loves Dartmouth, that's great. I love Dartmouth too. It's a fine school. I, at Middlebury College, don't want to know why your kid loves Dartmouth, right? So make sure that as we walk through this process, you're tailoring these different supplements and pieces that you send to the schools. Uh, inter I talked about art supplements already. Interviews can be uh, an enjoyable and fun way to get to know a student. If your student interviews well, great. Some interviews are done by, are done by admissions people. Some are done by alums. Uh, this differs school by school. Okay, I've, I've addressed some of this already, so I'll go a little faster. Um, we have already talked a little bit about cost, merit versus need. Merit money is if your kid has academic numbers uh, that will generate a scholarship that is not necessarily tied to your financial need. Need-based aid is not tied to merit. Doesn't matter how smart your kid is, right? So Middlebury College, we're not giving any aid based on anything other than whether or not you can pay the bill. And if you can't pay the bill, we give you as much financial aid as you, as you need, essentially. So I've talked about some of this stuff already. Um, my parents were lovely people. I keep, I keep picking on them. They were lovely people. My parents never talked to me about the affordability of college. And so I went off to a school that, frankly, I think was very difficult for them to afford. I still feel guilty about that, frankly, that uh, I watched them sacrifice to do that. I really wish they had sat me down at age 17 to just be honest about what was possible. Because you know what? I think I still would be the incredibly engaging, fascinating person that I am if I had gone to a different school. I, I would have been OK. right? So have, 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 uh, have honest conversations about that. Let's have some questions. Um, if any of you, you know, I'm I, I, obviously happy to talk shop about this stuff. You have excellent college counselors here, but you're welcome to send me an email if you would like to do that. So thank you, and let's go to questions. So in a way, that's what that mastery transcript, that's one of the things that a mastery portfolio is going gonna, is gonna to indicate. So uh, if your student has a diagnosed learning difference, I would not, there's no need to keep that a secret. There's no need to have that be something that's not part of the profile. Um, I was an English teacher. Some of my favorite former students are kids who had, for example, dyslexia or a processing disorder. They were still great students. They actually, this gets at exactly what we were talking about. They were great students who got a B plus from me. But man, did they work their tail off. And they had incisive things to say in class. And they were excellent readers of literature. But they also had a couple of speed bumps in their way. Um, and so that disclosure, right, coming probably most appropriate coming from the student themselves or the college counselor or both of you. But to be able to say, I need to tell you that when you look at my transcript, you're going to see a B in English. I love English. It's actually my favorite subject. And maybe the teacher recommendation also says, Sammy loves English and was such a valuable addition to our class. He's got pretty severe dyslexia, and so that hampered his ability to get an A-plus in my class. But make no mistake, this is, a, this is a true scholar of literature. And so I think that fleshing out those, those pieces can be helpful, and they add very important context. Yes? Sure. The question is, I'm trying to remember, the question is, and the previous question was uh, how to disclose learning differences. Uh, this question is, um, how is the denominator, I was, you know, I have, I have two degrees in English. I'm not real great on denominators and numerators. Um, so I would say, you know, there are, when I applied to college, when you all applied to college, we filled out a paper application. I did mine on, on an IBM Selectrix uh, typewriter, and it was Swarthmore College's application. That's all changed, right? So the common application now allows kids to send the same app to all kinds of schools. Um, so there, there, if you just look at the data, there are more kids applying to college than there were year, years ago. Uh, and there are more, uh, specifically, there are more students from historically underrepresented backgrounds applying to college than there were 10, 15, 20 years ago. Uh, and the average number of colleges that students apply to has gone way up since when we were all young. 
And so that's partly why the sort of, I look at all these transcripts and they feel the same. That, that's partly why that has happened. Um, I actually think, I mean, I, I love what I do partly because I have the freedom to read into those applications as thoroughly as I can and make decisions based on, you know, the human being that's in front of me, right? And so this is, might, might be frustrating for parents to hear, but there's no, there's no real way to sort of know, you know, of those 13,000 apps, is my kid going to emerge as, you know, in the tip-top echelon or not? Because it's not the SAT anymore that's going to do that, which it was 10 years ago or more. It's not, I'm ranked 13th in the class of 305, because more and more schools aren't doing that anymore. So for me, I sort of think of it as, as that number grows, how many kids in our applicant pool could do the work at Middlebury College? Spoiler alert, most of them, right? And so then of those, how many spark in a way that makes us feel this is a great fit, maybe because of a particular academic program or there's a student's personality or whatever? I don't really feel like I answered your question, but that's the best I can do. Yes? So the way we read international students, we read by, uh, we read by, by citizenship. So you, if you are an American citizen, no matter where you live in the world, we read you as an American citizen. And then if you are um, an international student, even at an, at an American school, we read you through the lens of an international student. And part of that is uh, we have to do that for financial reasons. This, this turns out not to have been the right choice. Um, so financially, Middlebury is need blind for anybody, really, um, for anybody who is, and now we have to tighten this slide. Dallas is not our friend. Um, financially, we're need blind for all US citizens, permanent residents, and uh, undocumented students, and we're need aware for international students. So long story short, if you are an American student who has lived abroad, you did two years of school abroad, and now you're at Pomfret. Sure, so we, so we would actually read that application uh, we, would, we would assign that application to two different readers. One of them would be the Pomfret reader, and one of them would be the international reader, so that both of those lenses are sort of represented. So dual, again, it depends, on where, it depends on citizenship and where you live. So a dual, a dual citizen who, with Ireland, who's never lived in Ireland, is just like anybody else, right? A dual citizen with Ireland who's lived only in Ireland and actually applies to us from an Irish school we still read as an American citizen for financial purposes, but we read that with an international lens. The dual citizen who lived in Ireland until eighth grade and then came to Pomfret will read with both lenses. Last question. Last question, this gentleman. How do you how do you assess school culture for the purpose of fit? Uh, great question, and I would say as a parent, this is probably your number one role in helping your kid because you know your kid quite well and you can help them ask those questions. Um, I would get at, you know, academic culture. Um, you know, who is your kid? I mean, is your kid that hard charger, you know, who stays up all night to get the A? There are colleges where that is the culture and your kid might enjoy that culture. There are colleges where that, if that is the culture at the school and that's not your kid, your kid's going to be very unhappy, right? So asking questions about academic culture, and just sort of school life culture. What do kids do around here on the weekend? You know, is this a big frat and sorority school or is there none of that? Do kids get in the car and get off campus all weekend or is it a campus-based kind of place? If I'm a math major, can I still be in the improv comedy troupe because I, I think I'm funny? Or is somebody gonna tell me, no, you have to be a theater major to do that? Um, I think asking, you know, talking to kids. What are the kids, talk, you, know, you know what you should do? Go to a dining hall and just eavesdrop. And I'm serious. Go to lunch and just sit there and eavesdrop, right? And the kid who says, Susie, I did the most fascinating project the other day in organic chemistry is a very different eavesdropping experience than, um, I mean, I woke up in the bushes today <laughs> and I, I don't know how I got there, right? All right, thank you very much. <laughs>